because of our personality traits and we are focused on on winning and strategy we can almost get unfocused because we got so many things going on and so i would say for for people wanting to get into the production side you got to have focus and you got to have a game plan and the the beauty of the locked in model is essentially you're given a platform to entrepreneurially build your own business and decide where you want to take that. But you can't be experimenting forever. You got to go implement, right? And so you got to be real clear on your why and what your what your strategy is, how you're going to get there, how you're going to build out your network. That's back to, to James Peterson. It's been, it's it's honestly been humbling to watch him attack the transportation and logistics space and how quickly he's built out a network. And I'm constantly, I'm a, like you up real early in the morning reading stuff and I'm constantly forwarding him information that I find um, because I can tell he's just, he's geared into to making that work. And that goes back to that word focus. So, you know, people looking to, to get into this business, um, you know, if you're right out of school and you don't have a network or a, a understanding of business, understand that the insurance business is a marathon, not a sprint. You're not going to have any big wins early on. You're going to get used. The whole game gets turned around on you and you just get your teeth kicked in. But so did the rest of us. Like, that's how we got good at what we do by getting knocked down and getting back up. So if you're going to get into it, don't do it for two years. You're just going to waste your time and everybody else's. Commit to it 110%. Stay at it. And, you know, whether you're 22 and then it's 32 or 32 and then it's 42, you put 10 hard years in this business and it's it's as rewarding or more than anything I've ever seen out there from a work-life balance financially. If you're a curious person, you're constantly inside the minds of business owners, figuring out what's important to them, how they think through risk, right? I mean, without insurance, right, wrong, or indifferent, the bank's not going to lend you that money, mm -hmm. right? You, you would not be able to grow or take on as much as you can with insurance as a vehicle. So it's as ingrained, you know, again, back to it not being sexy, fine, look at it that way. But don't forget that it is a part of just about everything we do. Welcome to Winning Strategies Playbook, the podcast where we welcome business leaders, CEOs, and industry experts to discuss the rise to the top, building wealth, and real estate insights. Here's your host, Jeremy Spann. So, welcome to Winning Strategies Playbook, a podcast and YouTube series to bring on great guests. If you're looking for more information, go to our website, My Experienced, and that's Experienced with an ED, MyExperiencedRealtor.com. Click on podcast, go down, look for whoever this guest is that you want to find out more information on. And today's guest is the great Michael Moore. Wow. Michael, God, it's good to see you. Good to see you too. You say that really well. Well, you know, the thing is, is you really are like a good, because we were just talking about out there, a good brandy or a good scotch, a good bourbon, a good whiskey. You just get better with age, man. <laughs> Some people would say it's an acquired taste. Too. <laughs> <laughs> so my father-in-law says that I have to start every one of these with a joke. Okay. And so I came up with one for you in your industry. All right. I got to put on my old man glasses just to read my own handwriting, not because the handwriting's bad. I can't even read it. I could write it in big five inch block letters and not see it. Um, so this is a question for you. And actually I'm looking for the answer. There's no punchline. Okay. Is, you, you, so you're, you're in the insurance industry. So um, Correct. would transformers buy life insurance or car insurance? Both. <laughs> <laughs> so 
looking like a true insurance guy. <laughs> Not even any hesitation out of that. There you go. That is that, that's I I wouldn't expect anything anything less out of you, Michael. So two different purposes, man. Two different risks. That is great. How's your dad doing, Bob? Thank you. First of all, um, let me step back for a second and say that I'm I'm excited to be here. Uh, I really like what you're doing. Um, you mentioned out there, and and I had written it down um, to thank you. I mean, Veterans Day was earlier this week, as well as the 245th birthday of the Marine Corps. Um, so. Thank you for your service and your sacrifice. Really do appreciate it. Thank you for that. being worth it. Absolutely. My dad, um, who you got to meet at, uh, we were at a, a speaker series at the Fort Worth Club, if I remember correctly. The Great Deformation by David Stockton. You got a brain like an elephant. I had um, to Google it. I remember the name of the book. I couldn't remember who did it. Then, and so I Googled it right before we came in here. <laughs> so I had, uh, had the pleasure to go see my dad a couple weeks ago and get eyes on him. Um, you know, he's, he is, uh, on the final chapter with his battle with ALS. So it's not getting any better. And, um, what I spend a lot of time, uh, praying and thinking about is that he gets to, to go out with, with grace and dignity. And, um, he's got a, an amazing wife. He's got wonderful caretakers uh, two sons that love him more than anything, and uh, and a stepdaughter that that feels the same way. So he's he's surrounded, um, but I you know it's 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 interesting perspective to watch this, and someone that's dedicated so much of their life to being a very spiritual, I and mean, you probably picked up on that just meeting him. Um, curiosity, just wonder of, of, of the other side and that transformation and how you go through that. It's like, uh, what's that saying? The, um, the cobbler's kid has no shoes. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he prepared so much. It's almost harder for him, I think, because in some ways, maybe he's overthinking it a little bit. And I, I just, I really feel for him because I know he knows what to do, but actually executing that um, is just tough. Yeah. And so he he's right on that, that border where it's not going to get a whole lot prettier, right? I mean, I think that's probably the easiest way to say it. And, um, and so I'm just hopeful that, uh, that he can, he can head to the next chapter and um, not be in a lot of pain doing so. And uh, and then begin his work from over there, because, um, you know, regardless of religious beliefs or whatever, I'm a huge believer that the people here in your life, when they make that transformation, still have a significant role in your life if you choose to let them. And so I'm, I'm just I'm really looking forward to that guidance I know I'm going to receive from him. I know he's going to pass down to me and my kids and, and just kind of keep his legacy alive through that. So that's, that's yeah. the, that's the beautiful part of it. Yeah. And man, I can really relate to that. So my mom died oh yeah, 11 years this last August. Mm. And I'll try to even say this without even trying to choke up, but um, she fought lung cancer the first time doctors gave her like six weeks to beat that. A couple of years later, she got brain cancer. Doctor said, look, we said she was going to go on the last time. She's really going to go on this time. She beat that. And then when it came around to round three, we were like, hey, look, you've already proven that you are the, <laughs> the most, <laughs> strongest woman on the planet. Right. It's okay to let go because it's just so hard to watch somebody you care about so much go through this. But one of the best pieces of advice that um, a college buddy of mine from TCU had said, because he had lost his dad a couple of years earlier, I said, man, you know, I'm trying to think, you know, what what's left undone? What do I need to do? And he goes, man, just go down, have a candid conversation with your mom of all the things you've ever wanted to tell her. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, I, you, we think we have, we spend so time busy with life and everything else. Have we ever really truly told our loved ones? Like, this is what you mean to me and why, and here's some examples. Right. So if there's any advice I can share on this is, why they, why your dad still has the ability to understand cognitively of what's going on, um, do that because it wasn't, but maybe a week later, my mom passed away. Right. And then 
I at least, when everybody fell apart, I mean, my dad was a mess, brother, everybody, everybody was a mess. But I had that clarity, like, you know, I said everything I needed to say. And I was able to help the family transition through that tough time. And so my buddy, Steph, and I am so grateful that he gave that to me. But you're right. Your dad, there is something about your dad. It wasn't even you that I liked better in the beginning. It was your dad. And I always ask you about your dad because we were sitting at the table or at the Fort Worth Club. And actually, I believe he knew David, right? Right. Yeah, he knew him. And um, and then, it was, of course, it was really funny. I went on Amazon and bought the book only to realize that it was like seven inches thick of a book. I made it through it. I mean, it's been that's since impressive. then. Because, but man, it took me a while, yeah. you know. I mean, I'm an old Marine, man. I'm, I thought this thing was just going to have like pictures and stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's my kind of book. <laughs> right? So anyhow, I just think about just your dad has the ability. He He doesn't say a lot, but the words he uses – was a level of articulation. Mm -hmm. It was almost like he had spent a hundred years figuring out the right way to articulate his thoughts. And, and that was my impression of him the first time of just like, wow, you know, I've been around a lot of people in my life and I was so impressed by that. But I said, man, if this guy's this good, the apple can't fall that far <laughs> from the tree. And then, so you and I got to know each other and now God, almost 10 years later, I guess. I think so. that's probably right. No, you know, he's taught me so much. And um, I don't know that I've ever heard a better description than that. So thank you for it. it. He's always reminded me of someone, you know, if whether or not you believe in reincarnation or that you can carry things mm -hmm. forward, like that hundred year perspective, I've always thought that of him, like you're getting that from somewhere that that comes from another lifetime or another journey or some type of spiritual connection, because most people can't do that. Yeah. And, um, you know, I make a living by talking and you is, and me both is a lot of people do. <laughs> and but I think about that a lot. I mean, words really do matter. And as we you know, as I watch my kids, um, not know how to spell because everything is autocorrected on their various devices. The art of conversation and thinking about the words that you're going to use and then the the potential impact that they have, right, um, is an art form. And and so he's really taught me that that words do matter. And sometimes saying less is saying more. So that is so impactful when I fully understood that is you use less words, but more impactful words to get your point across. Because with guys like you and I sure. that live and die in the sales industry, and you and I are wired to be in this kind of industry. I'll get to that later, but right. we, 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 we love it where we, we love getting in there and talking. So we've had that probably learn to say less, mainly because not that we were trying to oversell it. It's just that that's how excited we were about right. something, right? It, that's exactly right. And then I think, um, oh, what's that, uh, that great old adage about, you know, there's, there's the young bull and the old bull sitting on the hill. Right. We, we don't have to go all the way down the, the path to that, but you, you get my point. When you start thinking like the old bull, you realize that there's a whole lot of other people in the room and they may have something to say, too. And if you're taking up all that air. Then you're back to your comment on sales, you're missing the number one key, which is listening mm -hmm. and asking effective questions, which is kudos to doing this podcast, because what I've noticed in doing ours is it's such phenomenal training for what we do, because if we can't ask effective questions and listen for that one little tidbit, that if you're not listening, brother, you ain't going to catch it, mm -hmm. that then creates the next best question and may take the entire conversation in a totally different path than you intended. And that's okay. But then you got to remember back to hear what your agendas were and bring it back around to create the content of your podcast, right? I mean, it, it's perfect, I believe, for what we do. So that way the listeners know, what is your podcast? 
Yeah, so we started a podcast called The Climb, Crossroads in Defining Moments, and we bring on guests, um, typically audience of, of entrepreneurs, thought leaders, C-level guys inside corporations, multi-generational family businesses, to talk about their crossroads in defining moments of how they got where they got. And without, it happens every single time, there are two or three situations where they get to a crossroad and they had to go left and they had to go right. And it was either a really good decision or they were retooling and starting over again. And we hone in on that. And um, it's, it has taken off like wildfire. I think we've released nine or 10 episodes so far. We release one every two weeks. And it's the last time I looked at the stats, which was a couple of weeks ago, it's been downloaded in 43 states and 10 countries. Wow. So it is getting out there. Thank you to all the listeners. <laughs> Keep listening. <laughs> we'll and, make sure uh, to put that uh, link in there so that way y'all can have yeah, access so we, to it. Yeah, so we've got a, we can put it all on your landing page. We've yeah. got a website. You can find us on LinkedIn. You can find us on, on Spotify and Apple. And um, we, like you, are not quite as far along with our YouTube channel, but we're starting to figure that piece out so as well. What? And you and I talked about this the other day a little bit, but I really want to go into like, I know for me, I had been thinking about doing a podcast for two years and then finally did it. Mm -hmm. Mine was, I, I knew I had something to say. I just didn't know what I had to say. Right. <laughs> right. And then, um, uh, meeting Aaron Greger, uh, of, uh, innovation media enterprises, mm -hmm. uh, who is our producer here, runs all the adjusting for everything to make it. I don't do any of this work. I right. show up, talk, no. and then they send me the finalized product. You know what you're good at. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> and it is not in the details. But she did a really incredible job of spending weeks and months of interviewing me, asking me a bunch of questions, and then came back and said, sounds like you're looking to targeting high performers, intellectuals, and that's what the content should be around. And I was like, oh, this is, this is great. So then I had my, my why, right? Sure. And the rest of it became actually easier. I mean, I've, if there's any blessings that I have in this world, one of them is I have been very fortunate to meet a lot of great people. And the fact that I can call them like you right. and say, hey, can I get, some of your time to come on here and talk about you and your journey and where you got, how you got there and you, what would you do different and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and the, everybody's said yes so far. And um, so what was it with you? I mean, what, what finally made this for you? So we didn't have um, quite that level of, of thought and intellect behind it. Uh, Mr. Span, it was more of a, <laughs> It was more of a pivot in that, you know, our typical hour, day, week, month just completely pivoted when COVID hit because we were not on airplanes. We were not in boardrooms. We were not meeting with people. Our company, uh, you know, in 120 plus countries was trying to figure out what the heck to do with our 8,000 employee workforce. Uh, so everything went internal, and Bob and I talk a lot. We've known each other for 15 years, and I remember I, I was on a walk. I was like, I was early COVID. I think I was averaging like 11 miles a day, just <laughs> on calls, walking and talking, trying to figure this all out. And I said, you know, are you bored? And he was like, yeah. I mean, I'm working really hard, but it's not the level and the pace and the interaction and we got on this whole hour long tirade about 24 hour news and just the the fatigue of that being at home and twitter and what where's the truth you got to search and watch so many different news channels to really get it and then and then have the the wherewithal or the desire to formulate your own opinion we just got really pissed on this conversation and we we're like, we need to start a podcast that cuts through all that bullshit mm -hmm. and just delivers truth. Everybody's got a story. Not everybody's good at telling it, 
So that you got to think through that on your guests, right? But we spend a lot of time strategizing about our guests and how we're going to get that story out. Um, so where we may not have done as much work on the front end to figure out our why, we're doing it now with the guests that we bring on and thinking through, you know, where does that rabbit hole go? And in their network, what other podcast guests are going to appear? And then we've taken it a step further to think about, okay, once we've done this for a year, then we're going to have a podcast alumni group and start bringing them back and letting them network together. Every podcast guest agrees on the front end if they enjoy the experience. Not only are they going to promote the shit out of it, but they also recommend three guests in their network to come onto our podcast. So we never run out of, I mean, eventually both of our networks are, I mean, not to sound braggadocious, but they're, they're big networks. And that was another impetus behind it was let's take this Northeast network that Bob's built and this Southern network that I've built and bridge them both together. He's a gigantic hunter. So he wants to spend more time in Texas. <laughs> I love Chicago and I like to spend time up there. So it was kind of a perfect marriage, but we started out, you know, like podcasts for dummies and webinars we could find. And it was like, God, this is complicated. You know, there's mm -hmm. gotta be an easier way. And this light bulb went off the whole, you know, work smart, not hard. And I'm like, wait a minute, Chris Powers in Fort Worth does a great podcast. That, and I was late to the podcast game. I was like Joe Rogan's 20 millionth listener, you know, like, I mean, I just, it, it took me a while to get into him and then I was hooked. Um, but I was like, wait, why are we working so hard? Let me just call Chris. So I called him up and I said, Hey, if you were talking to yourself now, knowing what you know about podcasts, six weeks into trying to figure it out, what would you tell yourself? And he laughed and he's like, I bet y'all are watching all these things on YouTube and webinars and beating your, and I was like, that's exactly right. And he goes, I have a podcast guy here in uh, Fort Worth, give him a call, um, tell him what you're trying to do and he'll make it real easy for you. And so that's, that's what we did. Um, the podcast studio is just on the West side of Fort Worth and similar to this setup, it's, it's almost identical and we get to do what we do and then go back to our day jobs and the magic happens behind the scenes and it gets edited and the sound quality is phenomenal. And he knows how to go post it on all the various platforms and, and um, you know, give us the analytics afterwards. So it's, it's off to a wonderful success so far. Man. And that's exactly where I wanted to be is I didn't want to do any of the work. Right. I mean, but this is the work. This is, right? right. I didn't want to do any of the infrastructure right. type things. I wanted to be able to show up, do my interview, and they send the finished product. And I'll even distribute it from there. Right. Um, what's, what, what's really funny is a lot of people, we've got a pretty, pretty, pretty awesome social media presence, right? Across all the different platforms, but namely on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And People are like, man, I always see your stuff. How do you have time to do anything else? And what they don't realize is that me online is really a five foot ten black guy out of Nebraska who's the younger brother of my college roommate. Oh <laughs> my know? gosh, there you go. He runs the entire thing. So Aaron coordinates with him and then he gets everything out and then keeps our presence alive on, on social media. And we're constantly evolving, trying to get better, trying to the attention span of today's consumer is a matter of seconds. Mm -hmm. And if you don't capture it right there, then you, you may have lost them for now or lost them permanently. Right. And so I just found there's a lot of other people that want to make money and are really good at what they do that I'd rather just pay them. Right. And they do it. So that way I can concentrate on doing the things that I'm good at. And, uh, and they're speaking of good things. You are the president of what? <laughs> so I am one of four presidents uh, of the Lockton, Texas series, which would include offices in Fort Worth, Dallas, Houston, and our newest is New Orleans. We opened that a little over a year ago. Uh, and so that comprises 
750, 800 employees uh, that the four of us, along with our CEO, um, help direct strategy and uh, and hire and manage and promote. And um, that's kind of the, that comes with the title. Uh, but in reality, every one of us is a born producer. I mean, that's what we love to do. What I mean by produce is identify and acquire new clients into the Lockton firm, right? Yeah. So our target is, um, you know, mid to large uh, corporations um, that truly are to that level where you're not just buying insurance anymore. There's a lot more to it. Yeah. You're you're analyzing your balance sheet and the strength of that. You're 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 financing risk, not buying insurance. I think is the easiest way to to say that. So um, we're very very blessed. This is a people business. It's a war on talent. And I'd put our talent up against anybody. We've just got amazing associates that that just care, right? They want to do a good job for their clients. And they're in every industry vertical. So you have the opportunity to be uh, a lot deeper than you are wide. Um, and we've got, uh, you know, a specialty uh, or practice set up for just about every industry out there. And that's hard to stay ahead of because there's always emerging industries, right? So um, I'm just impressed with this organization. I've been there for 18 months now, so long enough to really take a good, hard look. And the thing that stands out to me is there are, I don't remember the exact number, 12 or 13 international brokerage firms doing in excess of a billion dollars a year in revenue. And Lockton's the only one left that's still family owned and operated. And I just, you know, it, not that there's anything wrong with the other models. I mm -hmm. mean, a, a to be a publicly traded firm and, and be able to offer your employees stock is, is an amazing thing, right? I mean, that's, that's, heck, you could call that part of the American dream. Uh, a private equity back firm has a lot of of strengths and and opportunities as well, but to just be the one left uh, that is still owned by the Lockton family, and the Lockton family is so accessible and they're so into it, and they're all about growing and promoting. Uh, I think that's a a pretty unique place to be, man. And actually, the the talent thing is what brings me back to. Was it a year ago you called me about James Peterson? Maybe right? a little bit more than that. Yeah. yeah. So um, he, so I've known James for a number of years, and he's now, on, you know, on the board for Cowtown Warriors, right. the organization I started in 2013, and he's now the president elect to take over as the next president. He's gone. He's almost finishing up TCU's executive MBA program and just this dynamic individual. And I'll never forget when you and I were talking on the phone and you said, hey, why should I hire this guy? Mm -hmm. Because we've got a thousand people that are applying for one position. And or I don't remember what the numbers were, but I remember it was an astronomical number. Right. And you're like, we're not looking just to hire. We're looking to hire for longevity. Right. And is he the right person and why? Sure. And that was just, I, I'll never forget when you said that. And I was like, man, you were, you were hiring for more than just checking a box. Correct. There was a lot that was riding on who you were going to select out of all the number of highly talented people. Right. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah. And, and I mean, I'll, I'll, let me set the, you know, kind of the record straight on one aspect of it. So, What's really important to me in the Fort Worth office, and and we've got a long way to go, right? I mean, if we if we look at our our Dallas and Houston office, you know, both twenty plus years ahead of us combined, you know, seven hundred plus employees. Mm -hmm. um, the sky's the limit on what we can do, right? Mm -hmm. With this platform, it's exciting, but it's important to me that the Fort Worth office is a is a decision made by committee. And, and, and now James is a part of that. I don't want to, 
to make all the decisions because we're hiring really smart people that are going to see and feel and understand opportunities and angles differently than I might. So mm -hmm. uh, James was a, a, a committee decision by a lot. And um, that's another thing I'm, I'm impressed with uh, Lockton's HR and, and hiring department is the level at which they dial down. Um, and yeah, I was listening to some of your podcasts. You had Stanton Williams on here, um, and I know we're going to get into that later. But um, we use, we haven't used that one yet. Um, although I'm I'm promoting that idea internally, but uh, they they test the hell out of the people that we hire, and then they've got this massive database that they go back and bounce the results off of to say, okay, this guy or gal has nine outliers. Like we can't overcome that. It doesn't matter how much training we give them. That just is not going to fit into that role. Um, with James, it was like, wow, there's a lot of really good data points here. And so once you kind of get the clearing on that, um, then it's a personality fit. And, you know, Peterson's just, a he's just an awesome individual. And so I try to do as much due diligence with anybody on the front end before I even really sit down with them and get serious, um, just so I'm prepared. And so that's what that conversation was about, because especially early on with an office like Fort Worth, where it's all about momentum and we're moving fast, we don't have time to get those decisions wrong. Mm -hmm. And so, whereas when you're producer, you know, 39 right? You can afford to take some chances and, and make some mistakes or, you know, hire a young guy with zero experience, but you've got a mentorship program in place that's tried and true and proven. We don't have time for that. And so, you know, getting your insight and, and blessing and my, you know, respect for, for you and our relationship is like, okay, let's take this guy seriously. And then getting to know him and hearing his story. I mean, good Lord. Um, was just really impressive. And so, uh, you know, we we sealed the deal over uh, way too many Johnny Walker <laughs> Blues at Del Frisco's. And uh, I still don't think I've paid off that bill yet. But, um, we, you know, it was just like, let's go have a bunch of fun and get to know each other and go win. Yeah. That's what this is all about. Let's go win. Winning's fun. Yeah. Right? The alternative, where you are, where I came from. You, you've taken your career as far as you can go. Are you ready for the next chapter? And he was like, hell yeah, let's go. That's so I love how you say winning and going back to Stanton Williams. Mm -hmm. So you and I have very similar culture index results, right? We've got large mental batteries, which means we can get hit in the face with a sledgehammer 30 times and we'll keep powering through. Right. And our desire. My mom would have win. said that was that I was hard headed. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness we are, or right. else we would have put caved in our brains by now. And, and and the other thing is, is our our two traits that are as far away from each other are are the desire to win and the sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have. I mean, I, I like to explain to folks that if you were to look at a watch, right? So my nice little Omega watch here, my wife got me for an anniversary a number of years ago, is you got some people that operate at a pace of what day of the month is it, mm -hmm. right? They're going in calendar days. And then you've got the hour hand, the minute hand, the second hand, and then the little millisecond hand, right? And that's you and I, it's the yep. millisecond hand, right? Exactly. Is we're always looking how to win. And, and, and the funny thing is, it's not, yes, competitive, right? But it's, the winning is not about, ha ha, I beat you, no, right? Not it has all. nothing to do with that. Uh, if anything, so your, your profile and my profile, our B trait, need, want, and so desire social attention is also to the right of the bell curve. Mm -hmm. Meaning that when competitive nature is involved, and it's a choice to win or be friends on Facebook. I'm going to have to send you a request later because <laughs> right. you're probably going to unfriend me. But I'm actually going to come back and be like, look, man, it's just, man, when it comes into the winning thing, I just, 
And by the way, uh, a mutual friend we have, Jamie Peace, mm -hmm. he says that's what's called the asshole trait. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, but we we just we <laughs> want things to go bigger, faster, stronger, better. It's about getting to that next frontier, right? It's about jumping to that next level. It's about going. Look, I, I love organized sports like the 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 next person does, but I don't want to. I don't want to show up and play. 12 games in a season and then it's over. I right. want to know like, okay, what did I do to create value and move that needle each and every time? And so guys like you and I are, are less than 2% of the population is actually wired like you, and I, hmm. which is a good thing uh, in the sense of if the, re if more than the population was wired like that, um, it would look like a scene out of the book of Eli with Denzel Washington, <laughs> right? Armageddon has sure. happened. Yeah. Um, but it takes me back to this talent search, right? Is if, if there's a listener out there right now, that's just, man, I, I want to be a locked in guy, sure. girl, a locked in person, right? What would you tell that person? Like, Hey, do you want to come work for us? You know, I, Without making sausage out of the eight million points you need, what are would you say are two or three important things they need to do before they even get to knocking on that door? Man, that's a great question. Uh, I don't want to. I don't. I don't like answering questions with questions, but it, I'll say this: it sort of depends on what they're looking to do and where they are in their career. Um, we spend a lot of time at various universities uh, establishing internship programs with them to get them in the mix because we realized, I mean, going back to 1999 when I got at the University of Texas, I don't know anybody that went into the insurance business. It's just, it's not sexy, right? I mean, it's like, I'm going into commercial real estate. I'm, yeah. you know, I'm going to go work at NASA or I mean, whatever, well, I'm, I'm going to go to business school. Um, and so young people were not getting into this business. When I go walk the halls of our more established offices, it's full of young people and young, bright, motivated, focused people. And so that's, that's a word I wanted to come back to. One of my mentors drills this in my head. Because of our personality traits, and we are focused on, on winning and strategy, we can almost get unfocused because we got so many things going on. And so I would say for, for people wanting to get into the production side, you got to have focus and you got to have a game plan. And the, the beauty of the locked in model is essentially you're given a platform to entrepreneurially build your own business and decide where you want to take that. But you can't be experimenting forever. You got to go implement, right? And so you got to be real clear on your why and what your, what your strategy is, how you're going to get there, how you're going to build out your network. That's back to, to James Peterson. It's been, it's, it's honestly been humbling to watch him attack the transportation and logistics space and how quickly he's built out a network. And I'm constantly, I'm a, like you up real early in the morning reading stuff and I'm constantly forwarding him information that I find um, because I can tell he's just, he's geared into to making that work. And that goes back to that word focus. So, you know, people looking to, to get into this business, um, you know, if you're right out of school and you don't have a network or a, a understanding of business, understand that the insurance business is a marathon, not a sprint. You're not going to have any big wins early on. You're going to get used. The whole game gets turned around on you and you just get your teeth kicked in. But so did the rest of us. Like, that's how we got good at what we do by getting knocked down and getting back up. So if you're going to get into it, don't do it for two years. You're just going to waste your time and everybody else's. Commit to it 110%, stay at it, and 
you know, whether you're 22 and then it's 32 or 32 and then it's 42, you put 10 hard years in this business and it's, it's as rewarding or more than anything I've ever seen out there from a work-life balance financially. If you're a curious person, you're constantly inside the minds of business owners, figuring out what's important to them, how they think through risk, right? I mean, without insurance, right, wrong, or indifferent, the bank's not going to lend you that money, mm-hmm. right? You, you would not be able to grow or take on as much as you can with insurance as a vehicle. So it's as ingrained, you know, again, back to it not being sexy, fine, look at it that way. But don't forget that it is a part of just about everything we do. I, I love the statement that you made is it's really not insurance, you're financing risk. Right. And that is so important now. Like insurance when I was younger was just something that, I, one, I didn't know enough about. Uh, two, to me, it didn't seem as important. And then as I started going on, I also thought it was something like when you had really good insurance, that was only really successful people could afford it, right? <laughs> like, yeah, I'll make the kind of money to do it, right? right. Like, I mean, I, I wasn't in like a Geico commercial or something going like, hey, man, can I save a million bucks on my insurance policy or whatever? And then as I got older, it was actually my wife who was like, this is the importance of, of, of why we have this. Mm-hmm. And... And it really made sense to me one day, like we've got life insurance, of course, we've got insurance for all of our vehicles, all of our houses, all of our businesses, you know, insurance. we've got every insurance you can think of, sure. right? Um, and she, one day, because I was trying to understand, I was trying to wrap my head around it. It wasn't that I was against it, I just didn't understand enough about it. So I said, why, why do, why, why do we, why, why do you want to do this? And she says, well, she goes, Let's think about you, for example. She goes, you believe in God? And I said, yeah. And she goes, why do you believe in God? And I says, well, I said, I believe there has to be a God, because if not, my ticket should have got punched a (laughs) hundred times by now, right? Right, Whether it was the Marine Corps, the PD, or my own stupidity. And she says, okay. She goes, so if God, whether you believe in God or not, you know, if, if God has determined an exit date for you, are you in any control of that? And I went, no. And right. I was like, trust me, because I've tried to defy the laws of gravity for a long time. <laughs> and she said, okay, so because of that unknown, when that date is, are you financially prepared right now to service everything if that moment happens five minutes from now? Right. And I went, No. And she said, that's what we're doing. We're financially preparing. And hopefully, like an American Express card, right? Mm -hmm. Better to have it, not need it, than need it, not have it, right? Yep. And she said, that way we can get to a point where you don't, we're not leaving the bearers of responsibility on everybody else. Mm -hmm. And it just made sense. And I was like, oh, okay. And then since then, absolutely. And it is all about relationships, right? Right. And um, so good friend of mine, John Lee, owns Marshall Young Insurance. Sure. We did we did our MBAs together at TCU, yep. fellow Marine. He owns a couple of chicken expresses. He does though. own some chickenies, yeah. man. Yeah. And and so my my insurance, and he don't, don't get me wrong, he's great. He's absolutely awesome. But I also have you as a friend mm-hmm. over at Lockton. And I've got the Colby brothers who are really good friends over at Goosehead. Right. So there's, and it was like, I... Man, and it was just, it really becomes hard because it was like, look, I trust all three groups of these folks. And and it is all about the relationships, but it was really about the trust. I Mm -hmm. knew, like, if John sold his business and left, I would leave as a customer because I don't do business because of Marshall Young. I do business because of John Lee. Exactly. And then I would naturally come to you, Goosehead guys, or who, 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 you know, the other folks that are in there. Um, to do that because you're right, it is absolutely a relationship driven business because you want somebody to look after your interests. Mm -hmm. And there's so many wolves out there that will say they are, but they're not. Right. And, and so when James had 
reached out to me and just said, you know, and I, I, I pinged and said, hey, you know, I had a friend, I had a little friendly phone call with your boy, Michael Moore. Mm -hmm. And he said, what do you, you know, man, do you think I have a shot or whatnot? And I said, look, I wish you had an ounce of interest in real estate because you wouldn't have a choice but to come work with me. Right. But that was not his forte. Like his thing was insurance. Sure. Like he had been at a few other companies. Like that was his thing. That's what he wanted to do. And I think I even told you that. I was like, look, why should you hire this guy? Because he won't let me. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then, but I said, look, you, he had been burned by one of his other organizations. Mm -hmm. He left one to go over to one that made some big promises that didn't deliver. I said, you're never going to have to worry about that with Michael Moore. I said, thank you. If he says something, it's going to happen. And if it didn't, it wasn't because of anything that was controllable. Right. And I said, and that's what you want, because when you don't, and I explained to him, I said, it's a lot like being in a Marine Corps. I said, why are we willing to go be in harm's way? Mm -hmm. Is it really because of the U.S.? Yes, that's who we're doing it for. Is it the generals or anybody else? No, that person to your left and right. Right. And I said, that's the environment you're going to get being over with my class. That's how much I trust Michael. And by the way, that trust doesn't come building that trust without hitting some bumpy roads. Exactly. Right? Because we all are human. We all make mistakes. You, and, you know, I mean, and that's what goes back to this sort of decision by committee. I don't want to make all the decisions. Um, because I trust the guy or gal to my left and right. And that's the thought process that we're going through as we continue to acquire more talent. Do you, we've got an established culture and mindset, not only derived from going back to 1966 and what the Lockton family has built, but then also what we're building as a cohesive team in Fort Worth. And, you know, you brought up a great point on the relationship side, because if, if that goes away, the desire and drive that I have for this business would be really diminished. That's the part that I go home feeling, you know, when, when you take your work hat off and your hug, I've, in my case, I've got two daughters and a beautiful wife and you transition in, but you're, you're still kind of thinking through the day and processing. I always go back to, did I hold up my end of the bargain on the relationship piece? And Insurance, again, is, is so big. The, the Goosehead model is a, I mean, look what those guys have done. It's a yeah. phenomenal model for their audience, right? Mm -hmm. And then the Marshall Young Agency and John Lee, the reason I know him is because at my previous firm, we joined up with 20 plus different smaller firms to aggregate our business together so that we could compete with the attention and the the premium volume numbers that the carriers were going to require of us. Mm -hmm. And so the Marshall Young Agency and Gus Bates, my the, the agency I was with before moving over to Lockton, that's how we met. And that serves a phenomenal purpose. And then the Lockton model serves, I mean, so there, there's a there's a road and a path for all of these different venues, but I still think it goes back to relationships. You know, it's funny. I was just looking up while you were, you were telling that. So here it was when the Colby brothers and uh, their CEO took the company public two and a half years ago, opening up at like a nine, 10, 11 bucks a share. Right. And here it is two and a half years later, they're trading at almost 120 bucks a share. So when'd you buy in? Man. So let me tell you a funny story. I wish I was not as ADD as I am <laughs> is I, I've, I've got a wealth manager who does all my stuff. Right. But I didn't, when COVID happened in March. Right. And, and I always follow them just cause I was just like, man, they're my boys. Sure. I love these guys. I'm glad they're successful. They're big donors, count town. And, and um, I, and I was looking at it and it went down to like 35 bucks a share. And so I'd called Tim Hatcher, who's my wealth manager. And I said, Hey, man, run, run this down. I think I want to buy like, I don't know, 30, 40, $50,000 worth of shares. Mm -hmm. And he was like, okay. And he had called me back and said, yeah, dude, the, look, they look 
very, very healthy. That would be worth the investment. And I was like, cool, let me talk to Laura. And then somewhere between there and not talking to Laura, mm -hmm. mainly because I had, you know, we were doing so many things during during the pandemic of making sure our business model was going to not only stay intact, but we'd been trying to execute on a business model prior to COVID. But now it, in a post-pandemic world, people are like, oh, this makes sense. So it just got so busy right? that next thing I look is it trading for over a hundred bucks a share. And they were in here as my guest. And I was like, yeah. And I think it was like September 3rd is the first time it broke like a hundred bucks or something like that. And I was like, yeah, September 3rd, you know what happened that day? And they were like, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah no, we yeah, know, we, we know. And I was like, and I could have bought this thing at 35 bucks a share. And I, and I missed, you know, but here's the funny thing is you don't define your life by all the missed opportunities, sure. right? No. Um, and don't get me wrong, $50,000 worth of shares at 35 bucks a share and trading at $119.98 today sure makes me go, I really wished I hadn't <laughs> right. that opportunity. <laughs> you know, but I mean, you'll be ready the next time. 100%. And, and you know, yeah. ho hopefully they, they don't have any dips, but yeah. It still may it it still may be a phenomenal buy if they're going to two hundred, right? Yeah. Oh. Oh. No. So one hundred percent. That actually, it's kind of a funny, good little circle to come back. Is, um, you know, when I think about missed opportunities or failures or something like that, and like what you were talking about, this really triggered this when when you said you go home and you're like, man, did I did I really do? Did I serve everybody the way I should have served mm -hmm. them today? Is, it's, not the wins that I got that helped me keep going forward. It's those people I let down mm -hmm. that make me go home and get obsessed about not doing that. Right. Or like when I let a client down because I missed something. Right. And I don't care who you are, priest or president. If you go, Oh no, every one of my clients have always been a hundred percent. And I always did blah, blah, blah. And so I can think of a very, a prime example is this. Is, so we do a pretty significant amount of business here in DFW mm -hmm. with real estate. But we've also, for a couple of years in a row, been the number one um, team for outgoing referrals to other markets. Okay. And so my social media guy, who runs my entire social media presence, just like we're talking about, he was selling his house in Kansas to move to Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And I said, man, we've got an agent up there that I've used several times. And then... I didn't do any follow-up. Well, that agent had decided that they, for whatever reason or not, they let the ball drop. But here's the thing is, that was my reputation when I said, this is who you should use. And he ended up going with someone else to sell his house. And I was like, wait a minute, this is the guy that does all my social media. And he went with someone else. Mm -hmm. That. That wasn't a him thing. That was a me thing. Mm -hmm. I dropped the ball somewhere that said, I did not follow up this agent to go, did you make contact with Nate? Mm -hmm. And and that one, that one. It hurts, right? Oh, yeah. oh, because this is someone who I do business with. There, if there was anybody I shouldn't have let down, it was kind of runs my entire social media exactly. presence. And then. Uh, I, I was just, so I think about that and I obsess about that. It's like, what procedures, what policies, what efficiencies can I build in to make sure that I don't let that happen again? And so do you have any good ones that you were like, oh man, I just kind of shit the bed on that one and let that one get by. And I, I shouldn't have. Before I dive into that, I'll, I'll just. And you don't have I'll, to drop names. No, no, no. Yeah, I'll yeah. comment on. You know, that if you're not constantly debriefing with yourself and with your team, and I'm talking like in the moment, get out of the meeting, don't go to the next one, give yourself enough time to debrief right then. What'd you hear? What went right? What went wrong? What are next steps? What are angles we're not thinking about? And get everybody's perspective. And then, you know, again, back at you know, to the end of the daytime or early in the morning, whenever you have your kind of your quiet reflection time, be doing that with yourself. I mean, that's where the 
the hard work is, right? Yeah. If you just move on to the next thing, ah, it went fine. We killed it. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> Nailed it. Nailed that one. Well, maybe, yeah. but you're not, you don't nail all of them. Right. Right. And there's always opportunity to reflect and grow and perfect. And, and I think you're, the teams that you bring into these opportunities or that you refer to, right? Um, but that's, that's interesting is that's an opportunity for that too. And they're going to appreciate, you know, some of them will, Oh, what do we need to debrief for? I've been doing this for 30 years because you can always get better. Right. Um, some examples of dropping the ball. Um, you know, I would say, It certainly happened, and it's more back to, you know, what shows up on our culture index that I just get so many things going on, I forget what I really need to be focused on. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, that phone call doesn't happen the day it should have. It may slide a day. And, but I, you know, I learned really early on, though, that especially in a business that is so people intensive and nine times out of 10, unless you're dealing with a sophisticated risk manager or CFO that, that really gets it, they're relying on you to understand all of this stuff and right, wrong, or indifferent balls do get dropped. Um, you know, I never say, well, the team dropped the ball, the team dropped the ball. I, I dropped the ball. Right. Yeah. Um, but deal with it right then. Mm -hmm. You know, no, I, I call him tomorrow. He'll be fine. You know, I give him the weekend to think it over. And like, just, no, it just makes it 10 times worse. Turn into the issue. Yeah. Listen. Um, sometimes there's nothing wrong with standing up for yourself or standing up for your team. But just, you know, just come with, with humility and, and understanding that, you don't know what happened in their day, right? They could just be having a bad day. I can't, that's a good example. I can't tell you how many times I thought, oh my God, I've got to call so-and-so. I know he's pissed. Well, once we got through the venting part, it was just that he was having a terrible week and this was like the ninth thing and it just sent him over the top. But as we unwound it and, and talked through it and came up with a palatable solution, he was like, thanks, that was great. Man, I appreciate you calling me back so quickly. I think that's, that's probably the lesson in it is just deal with it. So in my house in uh, Pagosa Springs, Colorado, we've got some renovation projects going on. And I have really come to really like my contractor up there because we had to deal with several of them that mm -hmm. were kind of a pain. And so I, I was sitting there in the garage and he did this one project that just exceeded my expectations. And I said, man, you, you exceeded my expectations on this. And he's like, glad we could do that. And Laura started laughing, right? She's like, I don't think you understand what that statement means coming out of span is I have unrealistic expectations for myself that many right. times I'm just nice to other people. I go, man, look, you did a great job because they did. But I've got such a high level of expectations, I can't even normally meet my own, let sure. alone anybody else, that when I make the statement, you exceeded my expectations, that's that's just not, you know, like you said, words matter, mm -hmm. right? That is some words that matter leaving my lips. And I said, what makes you such a great builder? And he said, good question. It's not the product that I deliver but how I fix things when I didn't deliver the way the client expected. Mm -hmm. He goes, that's the difference. Wait a minute. It didn't go the way I wanted or liked or anything else. I'm going to come in here and problem solve. So that way I can meet and or exceed the expectations. And that really hung with me. Right. And I mean, this was recent, like just a couple of weeks ago. I thought, man, that is really really impressive because most people are so worried to turn in, you know, to, to lean into it. Mm -hmm. Like, no, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to lose more business now because now everybody's going to think if I screwed up this, I screw them all up. Well, here's the deal. Guess what? You're human. Right. Right. You, do, you, you, you know, as far as I'm concerned, there's only one that lived on this earth that was ever perfect. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and if the results is dying on a cross, 
thank God he did, not me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so that's why I just get really excited about looking at, you know, friends like you, you know, in that journey to get to where you're at. It, it's just, you know, we didn't get there because we, we did it right every time. Mm -hmm. Right. That doesn't, that doesn't happen. I haven't had a single person on any episode go, Oh no, I, I did it right every time. And, and if anything is learning that perspective around things is a perspective that I had to learn is you and I are designed more for a football season. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is you've actually had a team that went out there and won every game in the preseason, regular season, postseason, and Super Bowl. And so every season that starts, there is in football players the belief that we can win every single game. And whenever you get to one that maybe you don't win, you go, that's right, we can come back next year and next season, and we're going to win every single game. And that was kind of the mentality, like, we got to win. But then I learned, wait a minute, we should really be playing baseball, which is out of 100 and, I don't even know, what is 160, 62. 162 games yep. in the history of Ever Never? Has anybody won every single game? Not even close. But you've got teams that are the during that season, just were the best team that ever existed. Right. So you can be the absolute best, but you're not going to win them all. Now, and that's what I told folks that are wanting to do some sort of sales. I go, look, man, you're going to pitch a lot of people, but don't play football, play baseball. Mm -hmm. Go in there and give your best because there may be conditions that are surrounding that person you're trying to get their business that may not be able to translate into you're the one that's going to get it. Or maybe not right now. Mm -hmm. Recently, you and I talked about one of these where it's just like, this is more of an investment play that's exactly in right. time. Yep. Not, hey, wait a minute, what are what are we missing? You're not missing anything. It's just, this is one of those timing things. That's and exactly so, right. Yeah. Well, it, whether it's buying a house, which you know better than anybody, is oftentimes that family's biggest investment. Uh, or it's deciding who is going to handle your risk management, risk finance, placement, insurance, employee benefits, the whole, the whole gamut. The psychology behind that, I mean, if you're not spending time thinking about the decisions that these call them prospects or whatever, or having to go through, then you're missing two-thirds of the game right there. It is much easier, back to your example that we were talking about the other day, to just not change. I, mean, I say that all the time. Why do you want to do this? It's way easier to just stick with what you have. Mm -hmm. My team is going to spend weeks, if not months, trying to ramp up to where your incumbent already is. I mean, we're starting from scratch here. So there's got to be a, a curiosity or a reason to go through this. Otherwise, just don't do it. Mm -hmm. You know, go back and, and, and narrow in the issues that you're having, you, you, whatever it is. You, you didn't like the communication of the renewal last year. It was too last minute. You didn't understand the the increases that that resulted in and you're curious about that, that a claim went back, whatever the issue is, like turn into that and fix it with your current team first. Now, if that none of that worked, okay, now we have something to talk about. But don't just do this just to do it. It's it's a gigantic time suck on everybody's part. And um, you know, back to minutes and hours and days and and how your uh omega watch works over there you know i'm operating in mm -hmm. the fast tick spot so you know i don't have seconds or minutes or hours or days to waste it's like let's get serious about this so we spend a bunch of time on the front end in the same way that that a here's here's an example that happens a lot someone that is on the front line of beginning that process is 
because this is a relationship business, is being told you need to talk to this brokerage firm. You know, I, I know them from church or country club or I met them on a plane or whatever. And they don't really want to. And so in that introductory meeting, they're, they're trying to disqualify you. And back to why these podcasts are so valuable, I think, for, for our training, it's if you ask a lazy question, you're going to get a lazy <laughs> answer, right? And so, it, but that's what they're looking for. They just want to get through the meeting and tell you when the renewal date is and, and move on and go, well, they didn't tell me anything I didn't already know. Well, flip that around. Back to the psychology, we spend as much time trying to disqualify the prospect. Is this really worth putting the entire team on and tying them up? Because I don't think they're ready to truly contemplate what change means. That doesn't mean that it's never going to happen. It's just not going to happen right now. And that's okay. You put that one in the bucket of follow-up later. Back to my comment earlier, this is not a sprint. Mm -hmm. You've got to have all these different buckets of various stages of opportunities, just like you do in the real estate business. Yeah. And I love what you're talking about, even disqualifying the prospect. I mean, that's, so we've got a pretty sound process of what we do. And we're, I would say we're very innovative and different mm -hmm. in a very antiquated industry. And to the tune of, we had the equivalent of about $4 million worth of business since June that we said, you should actually probably go work with this person or team mm -hmm. instead. And think, I mean, that's, I mean, that's over a hundred thousand dollars worth of commissions coming in. Right. That we Big said, numbers. No, didn't even, didn't even bat an eye. Mm -hmm. And one friend of mine, I'll leave nameless, was like, what do you mean? You're not going to take me as a client. I said, look, you're looking for someone that is different than what we do. That you got a lot of experience in real estate. You want to be able to have a lot more say in the process. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But I said, with us, we control the process. We provide, you decide. Mm -hmm. We control the avenue, you control the money. And I said, and if that's not what you're looking for, then let us help find someone for you that will be more of a fit that way because that's how we work because our data and numbers and our results and our testimonials, whole nine yards can back up. We, we are the subject matter experts at what we do. And if we're the subject matter experts at what we do and we're really good at that process, we don't want anybody here to change how we're playing the game. Right. You're looking for something different. Let us help you find that. And he's still annoyed. And every time we go get a drink, he's still, man, I can't believe you mm -hmm. didn't do that. And there was another thing too, is he was like, well, I need you to cut your commission. And I was just like, oh, I said, cool, do it for 6%. And he was just like, what? No way. What were you charging before? And I said, six. And he goes, well, it sounds like you didn't cut it. And I says, no, I'm right. not. Exactly. Because I know the value I deliver. So I had some people going, well, you said no to $4 million worth of business man, how could you let go of that? And I'm like, well, I've done over $40 million worth of business in the last 12 months. So mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not hurting for the cash. I'm not here to cut the value to me is not defined in a number. Right. All right. That, that 6%, it, it's not because of the 6%. It's that 6% is representing the value of what you get out of us. Sure. You're going to get a lot more bang for your buck out of us before, during, and even after mm -hmm. the actual transaction happens. So I'm not going to devalue my team by, by, you know, now if the number changes, because that's what society says, the number changes, that's fine. Sure. But this is the, this is the value that I deliver. And if you can't recognize that value, then again, I'm not, I'm not the fit exactly. for you. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That's, that's your value proposition and they either understand it and appreciate it. Or to your point, it's like, we probably aren't meant to work together. Yeah. And that's okay. It is okay. And this is the thing that I, 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 I try to explain to folks all the time is 
Don't be in the convincing business. Mm -hmm. Be in the defining and unlocking your value business. Because guess what? I don't have this magical power that I can get you to think what I want you to think. Mm -hmm. Sure, can I influence things? Can I present things? Sure, sure, sure. But I don't have that kind of power, right? I wish I did. If I did, man, it would I'd really have a lot of fun with this world, <laughs> but I, I not only don't have the power and energy to convince somebody else, nor do I have that power and energy to be convinced of anything else. What was that movie? Bruce Almighty. <laughs> when, um, when he got like godlike powers yeah. for a week or something like that, that, yeah. that would have been a little bit fun. That would, I, I, I would have. And the thing is, is it, it, there's a lot of people that if they got that power for a week, they probably have a, like a lot of revenge. They would want to go do it. Right. Actually, I would find the people that I really, really like, and I would totally go jack with their world Absolutely. just because yeah. I had the power Turn to it fix it down. when it was all said and done. For sure. For sure. <laughs> yeah, that's, and that's, and these are, these are in, in, important lessons that I think this young generation who I, I, I absolutely am fascinated and I think that they are much more geared to be even more successful than you and I have been because they have, they, the tools that they have now were just being invented when sure. we were coming up. Right. They were born with these tools. So they have a better understanding to move with them. And one of the things that I have found is their generation is actually coming back to us now where I see the gray in your beard, the gray in my beard, right? Is Turned. The, yeah. Oh man. They're coming going, look, I don't need you to show me what's out there. I can Google that. Mm -hmm. I need you to help me out with the experience part of that because that's something that technology does not give. Right. And so now we're in that stages of our careers where people are really coming to us for the experience. The widget itself, technology has done all that, right? But I also worry about that generation, too, because they miss so much experience because they're looking at these damn devices all the time. You know, mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times, you know, a couple of weekends ago, driving my girls down to the ranch, you know, it's like, put those damn things down and look out the window. Yeah. Um, there's a balance to that. But at the same time, I'm fascinated in the amount of information they can crunch and and understand their ability to jump between a bunch of different topics and still stay focused like there's 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 an absolute benefit to growing up in their environment with access to technology and so many things at their fingertips but to your point they they didn't grow up playing outside and building forts like we did mm -hmm. right and so you, there's a balance where if they're not cognizant of it, when they get out of school, whether that's high school or college or postgraduate or whatever, and they're, you know, call it kicked out of the nest, it's like, what do they have to fall back on experience-wise? They got to be very careful of that. Yeah. And it's funny. And we as parents need to be cognizant of that too oh. and make sure that they are falling down and coming in second or third or fourth or not at all. Yeah. And realizing that, you know, life at some point is going to jump up and smack you upside the head and you better be ready for it. And, and it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. And it's funny you say that. So our friend John Lee, I was driving back to Colorado this last summer because I'm going back and forth and Laura was still up there. I'd come back for uh, a few days to handle some things. And I was on the phone with John and just out of nowhere, I just got extremely angry when he said he was asking about Maggie. And I went on this like tirade of five minutes and then I stopped. He goes, you all right, man. And I said, I just, it just dawned on me why I'm so angry. I'm not angry at her. I'm angry at me because mm -hmm. her life was incredibly disrupted by the pandemic, just like everybody else's life. But what it, did is it really put it on my shoulders to go, did you spend two decades preparing her for the world she was going to enter? Right. And it was just that I was really not angry at her. I was angry at me. Is like, did I do enough? Now, my wife says, look, we, 
we did a pretty good job. Sure. But there's always that, man, did I do everything? Because you're right with all these devices. I was joking around on one of the other recordings, like she and her friend can be sitting on the couch texting each other. And right. I'm like, you're, you're, you're talk, next to you're each right other. Next exactly. to each other. Yes. So what we do is when she's up seeing us in Colorado, she does her not favorite thing to do is go on hikes. And I'm like, look, we'll make it an easy one. Just get out there, put your phone down. That's fine. Listen to your music while you're out here, but look around, right. smell nature, see in. nature, take it in. Because guess what? Not that it's likely to happen, but all this technology and everything could go away, right? The chances of it are so far remote that it probably never happened. But what would happen if it was some sort of weird event that made the internet go down or cell phone towers go down? Imagine how much panic would be driven oh, at God. that point. Yeah. Just uh, people would just freak out. Sure. And I'm not sure. being the doomsday prepper kind of guy or anything. No, but, but I'm just think like, about what happens when your internet goes down at your house for two oh, days. You're, right? Oh, man, I've got in my house in Colorado, I have two internets. Because when one goes down, the other one's working. And when the other one goes down, the other one's working. And I can't take the interruption and work by right. not having internet. I just told her, I said, look, just take a minute to enjoy these other things out here because life goes by so incredibly fast. As a matter of fact, when we were out here, you were talking about it. Like in 70-something years, break that down again for me, right? Yeah, so it, it, you can actually go to um, his uh I think it's on on a post he did on LinkedIn, but one of our guests, Keaton Turner uh, with Turner Mining is just an incredibly introspective, wise 34-year-old, which just impressed the shit out of me. Mm -hmm. And he breaks, he had this epiphany at 27 that, you know, a third of my life is over, done. It's in the rearview mirror. Like, what am I doing? And that gave him the the courage and the desire and the drive to go start the the mining division, which he's done. And it's now the first or second largest outsourced mining operation for sure in the United States, maybe in the world. I mean, it's unbelievable. 800 employees, it, it's yeah. kids 34. Unbelievable. So he's got this breakdown and, and I won't nail the math, but if the average lifespan is 78 and you spend... 15 of it sleeping, five of it laying in bed worrying about shit you shouldn't be worrying about, three eating, whatever, and he breaks it all down. You really have eight years out of that 78 or 79 to just truly live and do what you want to do. I mean, eight years is high school and college. Eight years is first through eight. Like you start putting in that perspective, you're like, that's not much time at mm -hmm. all. So back to your point, like, yeah, go on that hike and put your phone down. Go experience life. I mean, why do we work so hard? Yeah. To to create experiences for our family and our loved ones. And that that's why I do it. You know, last um last spring break, I took my wife and kids to Spain exactly 20 years after I had been there studying. And the same reactions that they had of walking down these cobblestone streets that are centuries older than our country, right, uh, just blew them away. And it's like, that's what this is all for, to create that curiosity and that next generation that this is a, this is a big world. You know, we can all get in our, our zones and our bubbles and our comfort and our friends and and think that that's enough, and it ought to be able to stand on its own. I mean, that's a complete life there, but this is this is a big, interesting world. You got to yeah. get out there and see it. Man, it, it, my nephew is a senior at TCU right now, and he's been working for me. And he said, I'm thinking about taking a year off mm -hmm. after college to go to Montana. And I said, I think you should. And he goes, everybody's telling me I should, and I should go straight into the working world, go get a graduate degree, law school, whatever. I said, look, man, go do it. I said, careful what you wish for. Because, man, when you get up there and that is truly God's country, it right. will change you. It will make it hard to come back. My cousin 
is still up there. Oh yeah. He he went up there for a week and he's been up there 10 years now. Exactly. <laughs> he's like, he's like, you know, I said, just go up there and experience and see these things. Because one thing you can bet on is life gets so busy that once you start your work journey, right? He said, Man, you're gonna eight years is nothing. You blink and you wake up and you're like, I'm almost 50 years old. Right. What what have I what have I done? And and like um, uh, Michael Sherrod, who is in here for you, mm-hmm. when we were recording his episode, he said, look, when somebody's <laughs> laying on their deathbed, they don't go, man, remember that one really good business decision I made? Right. <laughs> right. They're reflecting back on family and things that were important or why didn't I spend more time with family mm-hmm. and things that I care about? Because there has to be this balance. And that's something that I think like, Guys like you and I, we probably struggle with by nature. It's because we're always so go, go, go right. that it's not normal for us to go, wait a minute, let's force some some balance here. And like by structure, when I get up in the morning and I've said this on, I don't know how many episodes, I have a checklist of things that I do. Mm-hmm. Now, I know a number of things on there, but I couldn't tell you what the list is without looking at it right now. And I've been doing it for over two years. Because it's not in me to be structured. Mm-hmm. So I, I have to have that list. And as long as I do this list, no matter what the world throws at me starting at 7 a.m., I'll be all right. 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 Am I going to miss some things? Sure. Will I drop the ball here and there? Absolutely. But for the most part, am I going to deliver? Absolutely. Because I got the bulk of the infrastructure that day done in order to press forward and be that person to my family, my team, my clients, my friends, my peers, and everybody else. But I had to create that process that I had to abide by right. because doing it on my own just wasn't going to happen, right? Well, but you figured that out about yourself. I mean, this last 18 months at, at Lockton has been more introspective work than, than I've done in my whole career. Because I'm surrounded by these giants of the industry, right? I mean, my my peers, what they've accomplished in their careers, um, isn't by accident. It's by hard freaking work. And so, through through working with with my executive coach and also um, Bob Wirman, my co host on the podcast, does this as well. And there's all different iterations. Some people call it a zero sum calendar. But on Sundays, whether it's I'm, I'm a big fan of, of legal yellow pads like this, or I have my computer in front of me if I'm being efficient because it ultimately goes in there, I plan out for sure the next five days, if not the next 10. And typically I can't go all the way out 10 and do this, but that Monday through Friday, from the time I wake up until I'm ready to turn it off, every 30 minutes is planned. Now, there may be blocks in there, like recording this podcast that I'm going to block out an hour and a half to two hours for, but Mm -hmm. that's blocked out. And then I take it a step further so that anybody that's looking to put time on the calendar, teams, et cetera, understand there's red, don't move it, Mm -hmm. not negotiable. Green, check with me first. Yellow, move it, plug in whatever you need to do there. And it's just to your point, because we have so many thoughts going through our heads, so many meetings to attend, a family, a business, all these things pile up. When your day is planned out like that, it's you're just automatic in your day. And the efficiencies gained by that, because you don't go down these, you know, we're both curious people too. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know. And ADD, right? You, you can. <laughs> that's a that's a tough combination to deal with because things will grab your interest, and you you won't know that you just spent an hour on that. Yeah, and you're like, damn, man, I that's an hour I'm going to have to spend now after dinner completing <laughs> what I needed to complete today, right? So that that's probably been the biggest growth. Um, in the last year and a half is just getting super efficient and focused with my time. Am I 
at my a hundred percent, I got a long way to go. You and me both. I mean, there, there's Sundays where I'm like, you know what? I, I need like Monday and Tuesday to just free flow my calendar. That's okay. Yeah. Because I know that about myself. Yeah. But if I'm truly sticking to maximizing my strengths and, and just getting after it. And, and when those weeks, when I do it, man, Friday afternoon, I am so done and so tired. Um, and then, and then you look back at your week and you're like, oh my God, yeah, you know, I killed it this week. Yeah. Look at these results. Like, this is fantastic. So, you know, I, I think back to your question on, you know, people coming into this business, if you want to operate at the highest levels, you got to be willing. To, it doesn't just happen. Yeah. For anybody. Yeah. I don't care how connected you are. Yeah. You got to go do the work. You got to dig in. You got to dig in. You got to lead teams. You got to make those teams believe that you have thought through utilizing their time on this opportunity. And the likelihood is very high that if they will execute the strategies that they're helping uncover too, right? It's a team sport. Yeah. Then we're going to win. They're not walking in there going, this is the fifth one we've done with Michael this <laughs> quarter, man, and he's 0 for 4, you know. Uh. Um, but that, you know, I think that's that's leadership. Yeah. Putting others before yourself. Not, well, we're going to win at all costs, and I'm good at what I do. Well, yeah, okay, great. Yeah. I mean, that is a strategy, but yeah, it's not a well-thought-out strategy. So let me ask you this. You could go back to 22-year-old self, and I ask this at the end of every episode, and there's a million things we would want to tell ourselves, but if there was one thing you could go back and grab Michael Moore, 22 years old, by the ears and say, if anything, do or don't do this, what would that one thing be that you just went, look, just trust me on this one, and everything will be all right? A couple of things. One, like, quit believing your own bullshit so much. Um, you know, like, you are you are only 22. You got a long way to go and a lot of people to learn from. And just admit you don't have it figured out. And and maybe curb that, that enthusiasm a little bit. You know, it's like my grandfather always kind of wanted children around to be seen and not heard. <laughs> and, you know, I was just, my executive coach calls it peacocking. I mean, you're just kind of, you're walking around, you got all these, you think you have all these fancy feathers and everybody wants to look at you. And in reality, you're a 22 year old punk that doesn't know shit. Right. Yeah. So I think that that humble aspect earlier on would have been, um, would have been helpful and, and, early on figuring out how to to just be listen to your inner voice too and spend time inside your own mind in a quiet manner really thinking through stuff i mean i just there was no consequences it was just a hundred miles an hour mm -hmm. all the time now that created a lot of opportunities and a lot of wins along the way but I, I think I could have been more systematic around um, not only how my words affected other people, but just developing that introspect and that ability to listen and think and, and be strategic and, and then always be able to transition very well between work and, and home. And, and make sure that you understand that balance. But the 22-year-old, the and I wrote this down, self probably needed to hear, you know, if you want to go first, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Mm. And that, like, that has to do with, thank the Lord, she saw something to me, like the, the, the life partner that you pick, is so insanely important. Um, really concentrating on that communication 
all the time, um, putting their thoughts and their priorities. And if she's listening, she's laughing because I mm -hmm. still have to work <laughs> on this. But putting putting them first, and that's okay. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably what my my twenty two year old self needed to hear. Just breathe, take it all in, and and be more analytical, not just this hard charging, run through every single wall kind of person. Yeah. So, where do people go? They want to find out about Lock. Sure. Well, I you know like like any company these days, we've got uh, you know an online presence at lockedin.com. We've got uh, you know great social media presence. I mean, you just go Google Lockedin. Our, our headquarters are in Kansas City. Um, you know, or just give me a call and I'll answer any questions that you have. Yeah, and so and you said you got a a website for your podcasts. We do. We'll put that on the landing page. Yeah. I think. I don't, I think it's, I should know what it is, but if you Google <laughs> the climb crossroads in defining moments, it'll take you right there. Not only to the website, but then we, you know, you can find us off of LinkedIn as well. And then if you go into any medium for podcasts and, and type in the climb, it'll yeah, yours right popped up. up right away. Yeah. So, and we'll have all these links on there for all of our guests to be able to go and easily find you and find, you know, the great wisdom you get to share. Thank you. Yeah. Above we, and beyond this. Yeah. We're having a ton of fun with it. It, um, you know, we're just getting started. It's just going to be exciting to see where, where it goes and, and how far it reaches and the feedback's been, been great. Um, you know, I mean, if you embrace, like I'm not, I'm, I'm still not on Facebook. I am not a social media <laughs> guy. Um, but I'm starting to understand its value. Yeah. Uh, especially from a branding standpoint. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier, you know, Chris Powers was so helpful in getting ours set up. So we had him on as an early guest and and he flipped it around and said, um, you know, would you be on my podcast? Which I don't know if you've been on a podcast yet, but being on one rather than hosting one is two entirely Man, just different wheels. It, yeah. It's tough. I mean, yeah. to flip it or like asking the questions and maybe other people would think it's the other way around. But for me, being on one was, was tough. And, um, you know, he's, I mean, he has just taken that podcast through the roof. It's pretty impressive. He had me on and he was just asking me about, like, we went back and talked about, um, you know, business plans and purpose and, and you've got to be focused and, and set out a path and a reason to what you're doing. And right out of my business plan, and I want to share this with you too. It says influential people are never satisfied with the status quo. They're the ones who are constantly asking what if and why not. They are not afraid to challenge conventional wisdom and they don't disrupt things for the sake of being disruptive. They do it to make things better. And I think that's also what I would go back and tell my 22 year old self, like have a purpose. Yeah. You know, and, and, and don't disrupt things just to disrupt it, do it to make things better. Yeah. I feel like that's, that's my purpose. Well, brother, thank you so much. For thank coming you. On. Thank you for the wisdom you've shared on us. I love what you're doing here. And, this uh, is great. And yeah. And, uh, I look forward to seeing your continued success. Likewise. Yeah. Appreciate it, brother. You bet, man. Man, I appreciate it. This was great. Yeah. No. I